A reading from the book of Genesis. At that time, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the air, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. For your life blood I will surely require a reckoning. Of every beast I will require it, and of man. Of every man's brother I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image, and you be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly on the earth and multiply in it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. The word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus went with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not on the side of God, but of men. The Gospel of the Lord. I think it's important to read uh, today's account in light of Matthew's account um, of the same scene. Matthew includes the bestowal of the keys to St. Peter after the proclamation of faith in Christ in terms of who he is. Then Peter responds and proclaims, and then the Lord responds and proclaims who Peter is, that he is the rock upon which the Lord will build his church. And he gives him the keys of the kingdom. And for the Jewish people, that symbol of the keys would have meant for them uh, juridical power. It would have meant disciplinary power but also doctrinal power and doctrinal authority, the authority to define according to doctrine from the teachings of God. And so what's interesting is that this location in which the Lord asks this question is also important and significant. He went with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And so at this point, you're up in the region where you have the source of the Jordan River. You also have uh, one of the highest mountains of that entire region. But also this place was particularly a place of pagan worship and idolatry. And so you had the worship of the god Pan in this location. You also even had a uh, a shrine to Caesar Augustus, right? So you had all of these different variety of human idols and errors and all of these false gods. And it is in this place that the Lord asks, who do men say that I am? And so it is in this place of idolatry that the Lord asks this question. And that's very significant because he says, who do men say that I am? And it's been literally the people that he is surrounded with. And so that includes his own people as well. And we can see that even with regards to Christ and who he is, we can run the risk of falling into a type of idolatry, the creation of a person who is simply something of our mind and not truly who he is. And so we've seen in the history of the church is that there have been errors regarding Christ, but the keys that the church holds, and particularly with the Petrine office, is what keeps us safe in terms of any idolatry regarding Christ and who he is. We come to know the truth of Christ through the operation of the Holy Spirit in the church with the authority that the church has been given by the Lord, particularly and first and foremost to know him, to know who he is. And so we see when he asks this question, who do men say that I am? They get it partially right. They're kind of on the right path, but they're still falling short. John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others one of the prophets. They recognize in him something that they have seen in the prophets, but they have not yet realized that this is the one who actually spoke through the prophets. And so they have not come to the right conclusion. So the Lord turns and he asks them. This is now not just simply that broad spectrum of everyone. Who do men say that I am? But who do you say that I am? Particularly the group of the apostles and the disciples that are following him. And from this group comes one united voice of proclamation in terms of who Christ is. And it comes in the person of Peter. You are the Christ. A knowledge of who he is. And the Lord responds, as we know from Matthew's account, by then giving him the keys. 
the keys which also have that authority then to make such proclamations of faith. Peter speaks of the common faith that they all hold, but he is the one who has the authority to declare it clearly and with authority. And then the Lord goes from who he is to then what he must do as the Christ. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected and suffer, and then on the third day after he has died to rise again. And now Peter steps in into something that is beyond his authority <laughs> to try and direct Christ according to his activities. And what's, what again is interesting with regards to St. Peter is that if you look at the different scenes of St. Peter in the Gospels, you see this repeated kind of stepping out in faith and then stumbling and then being picked up again by the Lord. And that final stage is what is important. So when in the early parts of Matthew's gospel, he sees the Lord coming on the water and he says, call me out to you. He steps out in faith beyond what anyone else is doing. And he walks on the water. And sometimes we give him a hard time for that scene because he starts to sink. But we have to remember that he walked on water for a while as well. He has the faith there, but it stumbles. And then after it stumbles, it is restored by Christ. Christ is that foundation for Peter. In the same way here, where he makes a great proclamation of faith, and then he stumbles, and then he's corrected and supported by Christ. At the passion of Christ, where he says, I will, again, proclaims that great act of faith, and then almost immediately after, stumbles, turns away from Christ, abandons him, but then slowly comes back and is restored to Christ, kind of at a pinnacle point then, after the moment of the resurrection. And so you have this kind of movement in Peter, proclamation, stumbling, and support by Christ. The Lord is that foundation. We trust in the way in which the Lord has built his church because the Lord has built his church. That is the ultimate authority that we operate on and that we have confidence in. The Lord desires to operate in this way, and therefore we operate in this way. The Lord desires to govern his church in this way, and therefore we are governed in this way. And so, as we see here, with regards to the vicar of Christ on earth, Peter, he stumbles over the passion and death of Christ as he is trying to reconcile the power and the love of God with what the Lord has just said. But Jesus takes him and puts him back in his right place. He has stepped out in front of Christ in an attempt to lead him, and the Lord says, no, get back behind me. Your position is to follow me. And it is from that position of following Christ with his eyes on Christ that then Peter leads the church. And so we give thanks today for the great grace of the Petrine principle, the principle of the magisterium of the church through which we have authoritative teaching based on scripture in order to know Christ truly so that we do not fall into any idolatry regarding him but know him as he is. And then knowing him, we can also then love him as he is. And in that deep relationship that is facilitated for us by the church of which we are members, we can live in that peace of knowing and loving Christ. Amen.